All right, everyone. Next up, we have Patrick. He is from the University of British Columbia, and he'll be telling us about the large-scale airborne electromagnetic geophysics in Julia. Good to go? No? All right, so uh, before we get started, I just want to say a little bit about where this work comes from. So uh, this all started as an academic project at the University of British Columbia in the research group of Eldad Haber, who happens to be my PhD supervisor. And uh, it's recently now, it's mostly moved over to uh, a consulting company out of Vancouver in uh, British Columbia, Canada, called Computational Geosciences, Inc., uh, that does uh, some uh, different types of geophysical consulting and custom software development. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, talking about kind of one particular application that we're interested in. Um, so kind of my research group and uh, the CGI, the company, are generally interested in something called geophysical inversion, um, which is the, the general idea is we want to uh, construct models of uh, physical properties of the subsurface, how they vary in space, based on some data, kind of limited amount of data that we collect from the surface of the Earth or from the air. So one kind of computationally interesting example of this is something called... Uh, Airborne Transient Electromagnetic Surveying. So the goal of this is to um, construct uh, 3D models of the uh, electrical conductivity of the subsurface based on uh, measurements collected from uh, some uh, aircraft mounted system like what we see on the, uh, the image on the right here. We have a helicopter that kind of flies around and collects uh, some sort of, oh, that, oh there we go. Um, yeah, collects, uh, uh, creates some sort of signal that gets sent into the ground. Uh, you get a response from the ground that's measured at this system. Uh, and the aircraft flies around over our domain and collects a bunch of data. So we want to work backwards from a bunch of these uh, curves collected at a great many locations on the surface of the Earth and recover some 3D model of our connectivity. So this is a technique that's used uh, quite often in the uh, mineral exploration field, looking for uh, base metals, for example. It's uh, becoming more popular in the groundwater community, uh, looking for kind of monitoring existing groundwater resources, looking for new ones. Um, so uh, mathematically, this is a problem in uh, partial differential equation or PDE constrained optimization. So we uh, construct some objective function that we seek to minimize where we have some measure uh, of the discrepancy between uh, the data that we observe in the field and some simulated data that we uh, compute given some model of the subsurface. So talking in quite general terms, uh, generally we solve this through some iterative optimization parameter and what makes it really computationally expensive is that we have to simulate the electromagnetic fields kind of all over our, um, the domain of our survey um, at each iteration of our uh, optimization process. Um, so again, just talking in, in broad terms, uh, essentially what we have uh, at each kind of location in our survey is an uh, initial boundary value problem where we have uh, involving some uh, parametric PDE or param uh, parabolic PDE. Um, and then we discretize this uh, in space and in time. And eventually what we get out at the end, kind of what we have to compute is uh, we have to solve a sequence of uh, large sparse uh, systems of linear equations. Um, so uh, how big these systems of equations are, how much kind of work we have to do uh, to solve them depends on the uh, sort of how finely we discretize the Earth. So how, how finely we uh, um, break up the domain of our survey in 3D into these kind of small cells where we hold the uh, uh, material properties of our Earth to be uniform. Um, and so in order to get enough resolution uh, to sort of map these variations in electrical conductivity sort of to meet the application requirements, we uh, quickly get to pretty big meshes, easily kind of millions up to kind of 10 million cells, um, and uh, have, tend to have kind of thousands, tens of thousands of observation locations. So that quickly gets to a point where uh, this kind of inversion or imaging mesh uh, is much too large to actually run simulations on over and over again as part of an optimization procedure. But luckily, uh, if we're thinking about an observation collected uh, at a certain location, uh, in order to sort of uh, to simulate that observation, we only need a, a mesh that's discretized finely in a sort of small area um, close to that uh, location. So what we can do is create a whole bunch of uh, very small, uh, small meshes on which we can run simulations very quickly. Um, and then uh, 
so when we're thinking about our entire survey, um, sort of uh, simulating the fields at our different observation locations become kind of trivially parallel. So that brings us to, yes, it does. Uh, my computer is laggy, sorry about that. But that brings us to uh, Julia and why we chose to, to do that. So kind of the reasons we first got into Julia are the kind of things you've uh, probably seen a lot in the Julia community, heard multiple times at this conference. Um, we really wanted to kind of close that gap between prototyping new ideas, doing research, and actually getting code into production, especially when we're not just doing academic stuff. We are actually doing sort of large-scale work uh, uh, for industrial clients. Um, and so sort of the old workflow, which again, something you've probably all heard before, is you have uh, kind of researchers, grad students, whatever, um, working in a language like MATLAB. In our case, it was always, always MATLAB in the past. And then we pass that off to a sort of lone magical Fortran programmer who uh, spits out production code. Um, so now we're actually, we're getting to the point where we can do our prototyping in Julia and then just automatically just take that same code, probably clean it up a bit. And then we're also uh, able to run our, uh, our production, uh, production stuff in Julia. Uh, and so we do that uh, using, we've uh, developed uh, at UBC a package called JIN, stands for Julia Inversion. Uh, it's uh, got a uh, kind of framework, got a few different Julia packages. It's got optimization routines, building blocks for finite element and finite volume PD discretization, stuff for regularization, gradients, and kind of Hessian vector products. Uh, we stay away from forming Hessians when, whenever we can. Um, and also, of course, uh, a flexible framework for uh, computing uh, these kind of large-scale problems that we can decompose into uh, many sub-problems in, uh, in parallel. Uh, so take a look on GitHub if you're interested, or for a brief overview, also look at the talk I gave overviewing this framework at last year's JulieCon. Um, and then, yeah, so just to kind of give you a brief flavor of um, sort of how we do that uh, parallelization over these kind of sub-problems of computing our um, sort of simulated data at different locations in our survey area. It's not anything complicated, <laughs> um, but the sort of the key, we, well, we use uh, Julia's built-in distributed memory parallelism. Uh, the kind of key thing for us is that uh, um, these kind of local simulation uh, objects, uh, they carry around a certain amount of data with them. And it's also very important to be able to do computations and uh, then kind of store the results, which can take up quite a bit of room and memory. Uh, the biggest thing being uh, sort of sparse matrix factorizations. We, we like to use when, for various reasons, whenever possible, sparse direct methods. And then we can, we can reuse those factorizations. So those take a lot of memory. Um, so basically, we figure out at the beginning of our optimization procedure uh, how we're going to uh, kind of statically map our uh, sub-problems to, uh, um, to Julia workers. And then we keep that same mapping for the uh, um, length of our simulation. Um, we can then uh, store references to all these problems in remote channels. So then when we actually want to uh, kind of compute our simulated fields over a sort of entire large area, um, we can uh, just sort of make remote calls to our, our Julia worker processes, grab what we need uh, out of our um, kind of uh, container objects for our uh, local simulations without doing any data movement, uh, do all the computations we need, usually using some sort of shared memory parallelism kind of within each Julia process. And uh, yeah, collect results that we need. We can do some sort of uh, um, partial gathering, kind of summation of results on our worker processes, gather everything we need on the master. So again, that's just kind of an example of, of what we do. It's uh, Again, from the parallel computing perspective, not anything uh, too fancy, but uh, works for us, seems to scale relatively well. Um, the biggest thing uh, for us to kind of fix the scaling is to, um, uh, yeah, um, is to actually, our processes where we are kind of stuck on our Julia master processes, just parallelize more things in the code. Anyway, uh, just to sort of give you a brief, uh, um, kind of a shiny picture at the end. Unfortunately, uh, as I said, we more recently started being able to really do large production runs in Julia, and I wasn't able to get permission to show you an image from that. So unfortunately, kind of sad, I have a picture generated in Fortran that uh, uh, sort of, if hopefully you'll believe me, we can now generate this in Julia. Um, 
uh, so yeah, it's just an example of the kind of scale that we work at. This is uh, something where we've got uh, um, four blocks, uh, sort of four um, separate inversions that we've done, uh, which each have about two million octree cell, uh, two million, uh, I didn't say anything about octree, so ignore that, two million cells in, uh, in the uh, uh, kind of inversion imaging mesh uh, with about 5,000 observation locations each. Um, yeah, and uh, I guess the only thing is to say that we're still not quite as fast as our Fortran code for kind of what's basically our vanilla application. Um, but with Julia, we can do so many more things. If we want to change regularization, parameterizations, whatever, we can do it all and it still will, will scale. And that's it. And just, yeah, thanks to the contributors to our package and the community at large who is always happy to help out online. So thanks a lot. Does anyone have a question? All right, well, I have one quick question. Um, I'm kind of wondering why you stuck with uh, BDF2 for your time stepping instead of using like an adaptive order BDF or something. That, yeah. um, so I think the couple different reasons. Uh, one is um, because of the, uh, we're usually interested in kind of a logarithmic range of times and uh, we can get a fair amount of efficiency because we're, problem's really stiff, so we're definitely stuck using implicit methods. Um, and when we use, uh, like I said, we like to use direct solvers. Um, and our system tends to be such that if we can keep a constant step size for a while, um, that our sort of time stepping matrix ends up being the same. So we, if, you know, a lot of the time we might have to do 100 time steps, but we only need to do five factorizations. <laughs> and then we just basically have to do the forward backward solve. And the other reason is uh, also because we, uh, one thing which, yeah, it's, it's interesting whether we'll keep doing this. We, uh, the sensitivities when we want to do kind of our Jacobian vector products and then eventually Hessian vector products, uh, those are sort of uh, coded in a sense by hand. So uh, if we're, we're doing BDF2 time stepping, we then have to code the derivatives for BDF2 time stepping. And uh, yeah, perhaps in the future we'll be able to do that via automatic differentiation. Again, that's another reason why we use the um, direct methods is because uh, we can reuse a lot of the information from that kind of that simulation to compute the derivatives. Uh, what, so yeah, basically if we've done a simulation, it's a lot cheaper to compute a, a Jacobian vector product than it is to run a single simulation. So if we kind of took away all those specific optimizations, we could, yeah, do whatever time stepping and then, I don't know, maybe use 80 or something. But yeah, that's the general idea. So. Thank you. <laughs>